Hello, everyone. Again, um, we're recording now, and we're really uh, excited to have our first session here on, um, on uh, this conference, Sustaining Church Conference. And we're going to be introducing Andy Atkins in a little in a second. Um, I'm just really thrilled to welcome Andy. Uh, he is our first plenary speaker today. Uh, when Hazel commun Hazelnut Community was just an idea, we hadn't we didn't have any land, we didn't have anything happening. Um, Arasha was a huge support for us. Um, we became a partner in action, and they have been a source of encouragement, prayer, resources, and inspiration just from really from the beginning. Arasha is the real deal, and Andy is as well. Andy is the CEO of Arasha, and if you read his bio, you will see that he is an incredible, he has an incredible background in advocating for the earth and for justice. He is perfectly placed to start this conference as he is able to give us a big picture understanding of what is happening at the intersection of church and climate emergency. As before we have Andy come and speak, I'd like to take just a moment and pray together um, a prayer that we have, and we're gonna pray this over Andy and the conference. I'll put it in the chat now, so you can say it along on mute if you want to. Um, uh, this is a, this is a hazelnut prayer. This is a prayer that we pray for our community and it was written together. And so I'm gonna lead us in this now. As we come together. Loving Lord God, heartbeat of all creation. Thank you for today, for this place and these people. Would you meet us in earth in seed and soil and in each other. Would you meet us in the beautiful ordinary? Meet us in hard work and play and a great cup of tea. Sing us to stillness and guide us to peace, close to all that is created. May your love take root in us, growing deep, so we know we and all creation belong. And then all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. Bless this day and all that is growing, all that is complete, and all that is yet to be finished, that all may be in you, and you may be in all. Amen. All right, I'm gonna hand over to Andy now. I'll try, I'll try that again. I've unmuted myself. Um, good afternoon, or possibly good morning or good evening, depending on, on where you are in the world. Um, I'm, I also feel very privileged to be here. Um, it is great to be in partnership with Hazel Lurton. We're very, very excited at Arosha um, to see what you're doing uh, out there, as it is from London uh, in Bristol. Um, so thanks for inviting me and I look forward to being part of this, uh, though I can't be at all of it. I very much look forward to hearing some of the discussions and about them from other colleagues that will be participating in this. So let me start with a bold fact. Um, without land, there is no life for us as humans. We don't do terribly well underwater. We're not whales and porpoises. Um, we cannot survive without land. According to the United Nations, land provides the principal basis for human livelihoods and well-being, including the supply of food, fresh water, and multiple other ecosystem services, as they call them, as well, of course, as a platform, a habitat, a home for nature. We can't do without land. Simple as that. Humans use land directly 70% of the ice-free land on this planet is in some way used by humans. But land also plays a very, very important part, as we will know soon, if we don't already, in the climate system and, of course, in for nature. Now, as Christians, we serve a creator God who loves his creation, human and nature. We're all part of it, not just animals, it's us too. Um, and we are massively dependent on land. So it's absolutely appropriate as Christians and anyone else who wants to join us um, that we deepen our knowledge of land and that we look at how we as Christians and churches could be caring for it better. 
it's absolutely appropriate we do so, but it's incredibly timely and urgent that we do so too. That's because, as we will, I suspect many on this call be aware, time is running out for the climate system, time is running out for nature. Um, cut a long story short, you've got the world's leading scientists saying, unless humanity cuts its greenhouse emissions by 40% in the next 10 years, we don't have an earthly chance of avoiding what you could call catastrophic climate change, runaway climate change or whatever. Likewise, biodiversity in such steep decline, including this green and pleasant land. We are one of the poorest nature countries in Europe. That, okay, We have lost so much more even than other countries we think of as, as perhaps being worse off than us in Britain. Um, unless we react very, very quickly in 10 years time, the world will already be a very different place. Uh, not just for us, but for those younger ones than me, certainly, and many of us on this call um, coming through. And land is critical to dealing with those issues. So we've got an issue here for Christians. We've got an issue about climate and nature. We've got an issue for the future generations. We've got an issue of justice and much of it comes back to land. So. In the next 40 minutes, I want to frame the detailed practical and theological discussions I know we'll be having over the next couple of days with some big picture ideas um, and information, really. Um, it's a lecture that could last, um, you know, 40 days, actually, not 40 minutes. Uh, I don't think any of us could stand that. Um, but it means that it will be, I'm, I'm, I'm cherry picking the issues that I hope will be helpful for you. Um, over the next two days as things to come back to and as things to guide you as to where we go next in particular um, on these issues. So I will cover the centrality of land in climate and nature loss and the potential solutions that land can also provide. Really important to think about the solutions, not just the problems. I want to look at the resources that Christians and churches can bring to addressing land issues, the role we can actually play as Christians and churches, and how that might lead to a more flourishing, a more vibrant, a more sustaining church, to take the title of the conference in its own right. Then I want to look at some general approaches to how we go forward on this from, um, I hope, the history books, but also my own now 30-year uh, history of campaigning on these and other issues. And then I'll lastly end with um, a pointer towards something I think we can all do together in this very special year in the UK. For those who are not in the UK, I apologise. Um, but if you don't already know, the UK is hosting the international climate negotiations this year, which gives those of us in the UK a particular opportunity, I would say also responsibility, to try to influence our own government on these issues. So that's what I'll, I'll, I'll look at. Climate and nature, um, and land, uh, what the churches can do, how we can go forward generally, and what we can actually do this year. And I hope that will provide you, as I said, some handholds as you go through this very diverse and interesting program um, in, the, in the next two days. Before I dive into that, though, let me just say a little bit more about Arosha. For those of you who don't know, um, Arosha UK is uh, one of a family of, of Christian conservation organizations. We're now in 20 different countries. Um, if you wonder where the funny name come, comes from, it's actually Portuguese. Um, so it was set up by a, a, a bird crazy Anglican vicar who's still very much with us um, in Portugal. So the name means the rock in Portuguese, but we're now an international family. Um, what we do in this country is provide programs for different parts of the churches to engage with the environment. Our mission is equipping Christians and churches to care for God's creation. Now, the best known of those programs, and some of you may be involved in this, is Eco Church. There are already uh, almost 4,000 churches in this country have registered for the Eco Church program, um, which is a way of dealing with all the environmental issues we have, uh, climate change, nature, and so on. And land is a key part of that. Our next speaker, Ruth Valerio, uh, led the team at Arosha that set up Eco Church, so she knows a huge amount about that. Um, I, I don't think she's talking about that today, but you could you can ask her in the sidelines what that was like because she very much led the setting up of that. The second program we run is for individuals and families, and it's really important that we do give 
people in their own homes, things they can do to, to, to feel they're making a difference, to make a practical difference. That's called Wild Christian. That's now a growing online network of Christians enjoying, nurturing and defending nature together. Uh, you're welcome to join. It's free. You can find out how to do that on the website. Just sign up. The less well-known but rapidly expanding network, and this is really critical to this discussion today, is the Partner in Action Network. This is a network of which Hazelnut Farm is a relatively new member and we're, as I said, delighted to have them on board. This is a network of Christian organizations who manage land and we are working together to manage land better for nature and for climate and for the local community. We have now 21 members of that group and we contribute to it as a Rosha, our own two small nature reserves. And between us, we have about 2,000 acres of land that we are trying to manage better for nature and climate. But we have realized as a Rosha that the land issue is so, so massive and so central to dealing with climate change and biodiversity loss in the next decade that we have to give it a much, much bigger profile in the years to come. So very recently with the trustees of my charity, we've agreed um, three big 10 year aims. And the first and primary one of those is about land. We want to see vast amounts of church managed or church influenced land being used for nature and for cutting carbon in this country as soon as possible. And we've set ourselves a goal that goes way beyond the 2000 acres we're currently involved in with partners like Hazelnut Farm to try to get 75,000 acres of UK church managed land working for nature and climate within the next five years. We will absolutely not do that alone. We cannot do that alone. We can only do that by working with people like yourselves on this call, if you're in the UK, Hazelnut Farm and others, and to influence even bigger organizations that have much, much more land than we will ever have. So that is how important land is to a Russia now. I just want to say that so you know where we're coming from as an organization on this. So let me drop down now to why land is so critical for climate and nature loss. And I'm sure many of you on this call uh, will be aware of some of these facts or the broad picture, but it's important to restate them, I think, at the start of this conference. So we're really aware of what's going on out there in the real world of science and facts and how critical this is. So the um, recent UN report on land and climate said that uh, agriculture, forestry, and other land use activities account for a colossal 27% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And if you add into that, um, the indirect effects of food production and, and other things associated with land, it goes up to potentially 37% of global greenhouse gas emissions are as a result of changes in land, use of land and things connected to land. So next to fossil fuel use, land and activities around land is the single biggest emitter of greenhouse gases in the world. So there is no way we are going to solve the climate crisis without doing something very, very different with our land and our food production. Let me drop down to the link with nature then. Uh, many of you will be aware of the Living Planet Index. It's a report that the WWF World Wildlife Fund has been producing for a number of years now, but they do it in collaboration with some of the world's best databases on nature, um, top scientists with London Zoo and so on. The most recent report said that in the last 50 years, two thirds of the abundance, the population, the numbers of wildlife in the world has disappeared. So since I was a teenager stomping around my dad's rural parish in Worcestershire in the Midlands of England, for those who are not from here, when I used to see vast flocks of linnets and yellow hammers and lapwings and so on, we can see with our own eyes, they're simply not there anymore. If you go bird watching like I do, they're just not there anymore in those numbers. So the evidence of our eyes is backed up by the data of the scientists that the world has lost two thirds of its population of wild species in only 50 years. 
and at the rates we're going, which are not slowing down, you can see where that's going to lead us, can't you? So, if that sounds a bit bleak, though, I want to get a little bit of hope, and this is really important. If land mismanagement is part of the problem, then improved land management should be part of the solution. And indeed, it is rapidly being recognized by politicians and scientists and everybody else being recognized, let's come later to what's being done about it, as an absolutely critical response to the climate crisis, to the nature loss crisis. So much so that for the first time ever, in my understanding, and I've been monitoring UN climate negotiations for 20 years now, for the first time ever, it is actually on the agenda of this next climate change summit. Nature is on the agenda of the climate change summit. Now, I may be wrong. I haven't massively researched this. I'm just coming from my own knowledge here, but I have never seen that before. Now, that is a fantastic opportunity, a fantastic opportunity to make progress on the issue, as well as containing some risks. But I just want to give you a sense of the emerging recognition that the way we do land is going to be critical for the solutions, actually, of climate and nature. So let me move on to um, what can Christians and churches do about this? Now, I think we as Christians and churches, I obviously believe this, otherwise I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing at a rush. I, I believe we have a massive role to play in this. But it's not just based on we're Christians, we ought to do something about it. Or as a matter of integrity, as a Christian, I want to act. It, those things are real. They're true. We as Christians do have a biblical mandate to act on these things. And we should act, if you like, whatever the result whether we make a big difference or not, it's right that we do the right thing. I firmly believe that. But my belief in what the church can do in this is not just about that. It's come from a, an assessment of the real resources and capacities of the church that lead me to believe that the church can be an absolute game changer on this issue. Now, forgive me if I just refer largely to the UK at the minute. Obviously, that's where I have the best data. But I think if you're coming in from other countries, particularly in the predominantly Christian world, um, I'm sure you could apply some of these things to your own country. So in addition to the double biblical mandate that we have as Christians to work on land because it affects nature and people, that double mandate being God cares, so we should care, but also we're told to love our neighbour. And our neighbour cannot survive without a healthy environment. That's our double mandate as Christians. In addition to that double mandate, there's a second thing, and that is the gift of nature to us from God. I've been campaigning for 30 years. One of the most frequent questions I get asked is, how do you sustain your energy, your optimism, your hope, when many of these issues are pretty tough and bleak and could be depressing? The answer is, I try to enjoy the gift of God's nature to me, to remind me of what a beautiful world he has created, even if we are doing terrible damage to it to inspire me to keep going. I go for a walk in the local woods and my mood changes and I feel different and I thank God and I come back and throw myself into the fray. We've been given a huge gift that others haven't necessarily been given because they don't see the significance of it as a gift from God. Let us use that gift also as Christians to motivate and inspire us and others and to turn us back to God when we need to be reminded of the creator of all. So those are two, if you like, more philosophical things. But the practical, very practical assets of the church are huge. In the UK, there are 50,000 self-defining worshipping communities, Christian worshipping communities, never mind other faiths. In every corner of the country, every village, neighbourhood, city, suburb, you name it, we have huge coverage across the country that we could use to demonstrate good practice to work with others in the community um, and to change things on the ground. And while not all churches have their own buildings or even land, the vast majority do. So with those buildings and with that land, we can demonstrate good practice. We can cut our carbon emissions. We can manage them for nature. We can do what my wife's church, my wife's a, a curate at a church has done recently, put up um, a bee house, put up bird boxes, um, survey the nature in, on the land which instantly involved the local community going, what's going on here then? What are you doing? Tell us more about that. A fantastic opportunity to reach out 
to the locals because we've got land and buildings. Then on top of that, our denominations, not just local grassroots churches, but our mother denominations, if we're part of the formal church, have massive land holdings. Consider this. Um, the figures vary. It depends on who you want to believe. But it looks as though the church commissioners alone, one bit of the Anglican church, has 100,000 acres of land under its control in this country. By the time you add in churchyards, diocesan glebe land, and so on, you're probably up into several hundred thousands of land owned by the Anglican church alone in this country. Now, yes, it's all in little pieces and it's owned by different parts of it, but you can see what's emerging here. Huge resources that could be put to the benefit of climate and nature and the local community um, if we managed our land better. And then there's financial assets. There's the financial assets of you and me, Christians, what we spend in our own home, whether we spend it on stuff that is actually wrecking the environment or whether we're more consciously spending it on stuff that is environmentally friendly. But then there's the assets of the churches themselves. The Church of England pension funds, I believe runs into trillions um, and the other denominations that have huge pension funds, which they can decide to invest in stuff that is damaging the environment or they can decide to take out of stuff that is damaging the environment and invest in a green economy and land, which includes, has to include, land restoration. You get the idea. But I think the most powerful and probably underused asset we have at the moment is our voice. We are citizens in a democratic country with every right to speak out. Yet I would wager that Christians are among the quietest people when it comes to standing up for nature. There is no reason why that should be so. In fact, there is the very reason why that should be the opposite but for all sorts of reasons we can debate, perhaps in question time, Christians have not been generally among the first to stand up and defend nature. I think it's time that changed very, very urgently. And if we speak up as a population of two to three million regular churchgoers, we would probably be one of the loudest voices on nature in this country. And think about the fact that many of the most biodiverse countries in the world and I've had this drummed into me by Peter Harris, the founder of Russia, are in fact Christian countries, Brazil and so on, with huge uh, assets on the environment that we all need kept in good state, are Christian countries. So can you imagine the influence on this agenda if even 20% of British churches said, yeah, we get this, we're going to do our best on our land to work with the local community on whatever land they've got and to ask our national bodies, whoever they are, to spend our investments and to manage our collective land in a much more nature and climate friendly way. Could you imagine the influence of just 20% of us doing that? Well, I think we have to imagine that. I'm imagining that. Please join me in the dream. I would love to see that happen in the next five to 10 years. What a difference it would make. And I can't see why it can't happen if enough of us push for it. But I want to turn to something else here, which is back to that subject of sustaining church. And I'm sure that's a deliberate prey on words, John. Um, it's about the church sustaining nature. But what about sustaining the church? I know a lot of church leaders really worried about this. Many of them are finance directors for dioceses. How is the church going to keep going? Actually, I think caring for God's creation is probably one of the central ways that the church will keep going. And why shouldn't it be? If the church was actually acting consistently on the source of all life that God has given us, apart from his breath and the Holy Spirit, the land that we live off and live in, why would the church not benefit from a focus on that most important thing? So I think focusing on nature and on God's creation is massively uh, beneficial to the rest of the church's mission. Of course, the church has very wide vision. There's all sorts of things it should be doing. I'm not saying it should just be the environment. But think about this. Churches joining together with others to restore a piece of land locally that benefits biodiversity. If it's an open public space, also provides good space for the poor, the vulnerable, anybody just to enjoy God's gift of nature. So that's caring, that's serving for the local population, that's serving your neighbour the way God asks us to do or joining with others to call for faster climate change action um, because of its impact on the poor and the vulnerable. That's a prophetic witness 
That's another way of calling it that. It's a prophetic witness. It's speaking into the world what we believe is God's heart for justice for current and future generations. And it would make a massive difference in particular to the younger generation. Um, maybe Ruth will talk more about this in a minute, but a, a really important piece of research by, by Tierfund a few months ago showed what we kind of guessed anyway, but that for the younger generation in the churches, the environment is a critically important issue and they are longing for the churches to do more about this. Then just take my little issue earlier of a walk in the woods, just pointing people towards the beauty of nature and reminding them where this comes from is a way of pointing them towards God, pointing them towards our creator, helping build their relationship with God, which is also part of the church's mission. So it seems to me, the more I work on it, that the church is working on land and also working on you know, wider environmental issues massively supports the wider mission of the church itself. And why would it not do so? So I see enormous benefits, in fact, for the church in getting on board with this agenda. That's not why we should do it, but I think it will have a beautiful side effect if we did. So let me look at moving forward. Let me share maybe three principles that, that I've found to be true um, in, in working on trying to bring about big changes in society, whether that is how I started my career, um, campaigning for the return to democracy in uh, South American countries that were living under dictatorships, Chile being a case in point, whether it's that, or whether it was the Make Poverty History campaign, or whether it's now working on climate change. I, I have seen this over and over where we have made progress. Three principles. And I think this conference absolutely epitomizes the first of those, and I'm sure it will delve into the second and third as well. The first is to understand the issue from a theological, scientific, economic perspective. That's how I see it, much of what this conference is about, not the only thing, but a critical part of it. But secondly, we must take practical action on it locally and in our homes, whatever the issue is, whether it is back in the day, you know, refusing to buy produce from South Africa when it was under apartheid, or withdrawing our pensions from com companies that are invested in, whatever it is, that principle of taking action in your own life. And thirdly, and critically, we have to build on that knowledge and on that practical action by using our voice to urge those with more power and resources than we've got, whether they're local government, national government, business, whatever, to take action. So the if we do now, i want to be candid here um you know god made us wonderfully varied didn't he some folks could sit i think my my connection may be weak can you hear me okay yeah okay some folks could sit all day and learn and think and just use their brains you know i have moments like that where i think i just don't want to do anything else and just sit here and think but some of us could do that for months or years Others of us are much happier when we're getting up and doing something. We just can't stand all this debate. We just want to do something. Will somebody please take some action? And then there's others, actually also like me in another mood, whose first instinct when they see something they do not like is to shout, to run to the barricades and to start firing. That's kind of how I'm wired, if I'm honest. Actually, we need them all. And any single one of them on their own will not deliver the results we need. So in a community, the beauty of community is that we will have people made up all those ways. And our challenge, and it sometimes is a challenge, isn't it, in a church or even in a family. Well, it looks like Andy's dropped uh, off. 
I'm back. Oh, uh, you're back. I don't know what happened there. Um, I promise I didn't press a button. You're talking about family and it, um, it froze and then dropped you, but um, we're glad you're back. Thanks for that. Um, I, I think, uh, had I got as far as saying, let me talk about what's coming up this year. Oh, you lost me some time before then. Okay, at the risk of repeating myself, I'll go back a bit and say that in any family, um, you will have people who uh, uh, you know just want to sit and think all day. There'll be others who just want to take action, they're sick to death of all the talking. Am I frozen again? Can you hear me now? Okay. Um, what I was saying or trying to say, uh, internet permitting, is that, okay, if, if I turn off my camera, uh, hopefully it'll make it better. I'll switch it back on a minute to make sure you're all still there. Um, oh, I can see you, that's good. Um, what I was saying is you need them all. We're all wired in different ways, but actually you need them all. None on their own is good enough to make an impact. I also find as I get older, and this is not a scientific survey, I also find as I get older that actually I get better at doing the ones that I was less good at previously. And I wonder if that's a model of, I hope it's a model of maturing, <laughs> but I wonder also if, if it's an analogy for where the church should go is to get better at doing all of them. Um, but I think that they are absolutely needed on this issue. So as we go through these next two days, I'd really invite you to also reflect on where, how are you wired? What's your natural instinct when faced with a problem? To think about it forever, but not act. To jump to action or to immediately start shouting and complaining. All of them are useful, but I would encourage you to think about strengthening one of those other preferences, what, one, of your, one of your weaker preferences, to start building something that you're less confident at, because in the end, we need them all, okay? And to link up with people who are very good at the things you're not so good at, to work together on how we approach this issue. It, you know, the, families are made diverse for that reason. We need it all, but we really do need it all to make progress on this issue. So let me end then by just talking about this year. I'm sure you're all aware it's an important issue, not just for Britain, but for the world, that we have the Climate Summit this year. The reason it's so important this year, it's already been put off one year by COVID, of course, so we're delayed, but it always was going to be a critical climate conference because it is the time to review progress on the Paris Agreement from now six years ago. And at that point, the scientists were saying we had very, very little time to cut carbon emissions and so on. Now the data is even clearer. We and, and you know th th there's all sorts of nuances here but if we want even a 50 50 chance of keeping um global temperature rise less than two degrees above the historic average prehistoric not prehistoric you know uh, the, the pre how it normally how it should be we have less than 10 years to cut emissions very very steeply so the fact that it's in the uk is important to the uk but actually it's really important to the whole world that the right decisions are taken and critically, as I said, bringing it back to this conference on land, is that land is on the agenda in a way that has never been before under the rubric of nature-based solutions to climate change. In fact, we at Russia have a seminar on that subject tomorrow um, because it's really critical. But under the, it's one of the British government's five priorities for the outcomes of COP is progress on nature-based solutions to climate change. And, and at the heart of that is land and how land is used, okay? Now, to embody the three principles I was talking about, a number of us have got together this year to launch something that many of you will probably already be involved in called the Climate Sunday Initiative. And it is a way by which churches in this country can join together to do the three principles that I've articulated. What we're asking them to do is to hold a Climate Sunday service, to hold a service any day they want, preferably a Sunday, but you know, even any day in the run up to COP in order to look at the theology and the science around climate change together, to understand the issue together better as a local congregation. And then secondly, at that service to make a commitment to what they will do, what action they will do 
as a church in the years to come. Not just to say something one off, but to commit to doing ongoing action. And that could look like, for example, if you're already part of the eco church um, scheme, making the commitment to go from bronze to silver over the next year, which will involve looking after your land better, as well as your church building and so on. But whatever it is, make a commitment and register it. And the third thing we're asking churches to do is, in fact, to use their voice, to speak up. And the suggestion is that they sign something called the Tis Now Declaration, which is calling upon the government to get its own house in order in the UK, get us back on course with our own climate targets before it hosts the international conference. Now, there are already 1,700 churches have registered to do or have already done a service from cathedrals through to churches um, that have three people and no, no building, if you like. It doesn't exclude anybody, okay? And we are asking all churches to do this in this year to have the biggest impact we could possibly have in this year when COP is in this, in, in this country around these issues. And land is at the heart of those issues. Now, I will put the links in the chat in a minute. You can find it online, but it's a coalition that Tear Fund, Christian Aid, CAFOD, uh, the Anglican Church, the Methodist Church, the Baptist Church, everybody pretty much belongs to it. It's only for this year to make the very best as Christians this year of the opportunity to influence governments around this massive issue of climate change, which land is at the heart of, okay? So I'll leave you with that very practical opportunity for us to all get together and do something. But I want to show you too that it's a manifestation of those principles of understand, um, act, but raise your voice. And the importance of that is that if we raise our voice without acting, it lacks credibility. But if we act, but don't raise our voice, we're throwing away a massive opportunity because that action stays local and no one else sees it. And it certainly isn't seen by the government, so they don't get the impression of all these people who want something to happen. But by acting and raising our voice and telling the government how we're acting, we give them a more accurate impression of how the churches and Christians and anybody else in society for that matter, want something to change, which in a democratic country is what they need to see before they will have the courage to do what we know and the Bible says needs to be done. On that note, I'll end. And I really wish I could be here on all the rest of the stuff. I really look forward to hearing more about it, but I can stay for a lot longer for Q&A if that's uh, helpful. Thanks so much, Andy. It's been, has been really fantastic. There's so much to chew on. And I think it's really good that we're recording these because I think um, there's so much to think about and to go back to think about. And there's so much challenging as well as information. Um, so one of the questions from Pippa that's just come in now is, can you give more examples of raising our voice? So some kind of some practical things that we can do. Yeah. And I think one of the things we want to think about too is even if you're just starting out. So if you're not 30 years into advocating for this but if you're just like yeah. just getting hot for this how do you start how do you get how do you raise your voice no, fine. no a very, very good question and and, and there, there are so many things um question from paper is a very good question there are so many ways you can do that um often people focus on national governments and there's a reason for that because they have a lot of power but actually it's really important we don't exclude local politicians and so on so i think um any so examples would be joining in with some local activity to ask the local council to do something. Please install a cycle path where there should be one. Please, you know, whatever, that, that's raising your voice. It's just speaking into the public domain, if you like. The second thing is, um, another example would be, yes, signing, um, you know, writing a letter to your MP, signing online petitions, um, joining, I mean, I see a, something from Emily here, joining a, uh, a, an easy way to keep doing this is to join an organization that does it regularly, that, that, will, that will point you towards things you can do. That's one thing, for example, the Wild Christian uh, Network that we have does. Russia doesn't run many of its own campaigns. Uh, we don't have the capacity, but we will point you towards relevant campaigns that you can then sign up to online, whether it's the Wildlife Trust or Tear Fund or whatever, whatever is the relevant campaign for the issue we're dealing with at the moment. So there's a vast range of ways you can do it. The one lesson I would say is it's unless you're a deep, deep introvert, who wants to sit behind your computer all day and not speak to anybody and some of us are like that but unless you're like that these things are more usually and more easily done with others so i would really encourage you to find others 
Uh, so we're going to kick off something at a Russia called a campaign coffee on a Friday, where people can just pitch up online for an hour, hear about a certain campaign, be taken through it by whichever organization it is that is behind it, but which we would be endorsing. Um, we would think it's a good campaign. And then they just go and do it online, for example. We're looking at that for the autumn. Um, so that's just one, one, one answer to the problem. How do you do this alone? It can be quite lonely. Find somebody else to do it with. Join a campaign that others are involved in. How does that sound? Fantastic. Um, yeah, really good. Um, and I think hopefully um, in the, we go to the, after this, you can go to the kind of social space and continue to generate ideas as well if you're interested in doing that. So we can keep this conversation going. Um, just want to like pull up a couple of threads on stuff that's happening in the chat and that you've said. Just so you know, um, we'll, uh, someone brought up YCCN. Um, yeah. We hosted them here in Bristol. Fantastic talking about debt, um, which is a really important piece of this whole thing. Um, so, and we'll have um, YCN will be talking, YCCN will have a session later on. So pick that up. Also, Hannah Malcolm is leading group on land and she's gonna be speaking later as well about, and they're um, challenging Synod. So some of these things are happening to get involved in. Yeah. Um, would you speak a little bit, a little bit about the issue of debt in this whole thing um, from a kind of a larger perspective? Yeah, I mean, uh, there's so much you can say about debt, um, and uh, obviously, so th this will be short. I, I'm not quite sure, you know, precisely where the, the question is coming from on this, but but debt is certainly a, if we if we're talking about national debt rather than individual debt, um, it is a massive issue in this because whilst the Jubilee debt campaign and, and made poverty history. Um, led to a lot of debt reduction in some of the poorest countries. There are still many that has still have terrible debt overhangs, and that is indeed forcing many of them to sacrifice um, their natural resources, for example, in order to repay their debt. Um, so debt and, and continuing debt for, for, for developing countries is a, is a really big problem, both in terms of um, uh, reducing their ability to actually spend on climate mitigation and adaptation, you know, actually what needs to be done to address it, but also in, um, in, 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 in actually continuing to destroy the environment. It's a really big issue at the climate negotiations, not, not so much debt per se, but finance, and the two are linked, because for, you will be aware, for many, many years, the rich countries have promised the poorer countries $100 billion a year by 2020, that was meant to happen to help them with climate finance. But if that just leads to more, I mean, first of all, that, that promise keeps being made, but they don't find the money. It, it's a massive issue for this forthcoming COP to actually put the money up. But if that money is just more loans and is not grants, many countries are going to go, we can't do that. We can't even pay, repay the loans we've got. Why would we take on more loans to fight a climate problem that we guys didn't even create? You know, so 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 debt is a really important issue for whoever raised it. Uh, it has many implications for the climate and nature debate, and we can't stop working on debt. Uh, you know, it, it it is it is also relevant to this debate in a big way. Thanks so much for that. Um, a question from Sophie, um, uh, or Sa sorry, Sandy, is there a place for nonviolent direct action in a Christian prophetic justice tradition? Yes. <laughs> yes, thank you for that. Uh, do you want to <laughs> say any more about that? I, I agree. I think it's yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, there, there are there are there are there are. Well, put, 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 let me look at it this way. Um, I remember a story about a guy who walked into a church and was really naffed off at the way it was being used, and he chucked over the tables of the people who were there, and he made all the authorities very very annoyed. And he was called Jesus. So that, that's kind of all I need. Um, now, I, 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 I don't mean by that that we have a license to go out and cause trouble wherever we feel like it. I think you have to be thoughtful about this. It needs to be justified and so on. But, but if anybody says to me, Christians shouldn't employ non-divine direct action ever, I'm just going to say, so what do you make of Jesus overturning the tables in the temple? Absolutely. I mean, someone say that was a bit violent, actually. I mean, he didn't, he didn't hurt anybody, but he didn't just sit there and go, this is not a good idea. Mm. <laughs> yeah, and there's, um, you know, there's lots of writing out there as well. Um, Luther's written- well, I'm not the expert, so there'll be, I hope you have better experts on this subject uh, over the next two days, but that's my rather simplistic answer. 
Yeah, and it's just it's been a topic that's been important for a very long time in the church, and there's a lot written on that. So um, it might be the type of thing for a future conversation. I think that's really important as well, especially around XR and the work that they're doing. So really important. So I'm going to read a question now from Charles, who's from uh, Charles Croydon from Ipswich, and he he said, um, I have a question for Andy from the book The Conversation Revolution by Brom. I'm just going to say Brom and Robert Fletcher. Um, in the section, Elements of a Vision, um, from the privatized expert tech, techno, sorry, um, little phone, big words, technocracy, um, whatever, um, to common democratic um, engagement. Um, here's the quote, anyway, here's the quote. Convivial conversation grounded in radical ecological democracy would require that the value of natural resources be determined locally rather than in, in rather than in abstract global markets in what way should local people establish this value wow so so i mean i, I haven't read the book i don't know what the context of that quote is etc so i think I, i'm better off not getting too hung up on that quote but if you're asking me do i believe local sh people should be involved in determining what happens to their local environment, which is how I, I think I'll interpret that question. I absolutely do, um, um, for all sorts of very sensible reasons. Um, uh, you know, A, they're the ones who are most affected by it, so it's a question of natural justice, really. Secondly, they're the ones who probably understand it best, particularly, um, frank, you know, particularly in, in, in rural areas and in uh, developing countries where people are still much more closely attached to the land. And then if you go into indigenous people, and I've spent a lot of my time working with indigenous groups in, in, in South America. I mean, you know, you only have to look at some of the people groups in the Amazon or Papua New Guinea for that matter, who've lived there for millennia, and there's virtually no trace of what they've done to the environment. So how have they done that? They clearly, <laughs> they clearly know how to live without wrecking the planet. We're crazy not to listen to them. Absolutely. Um, and that's even more challenging as you see in the news of, um, you know, kind of the burning of the Amazon. And um, yeah. it's, it's really shocking. I think we'll, and we're gonna speak more, I know um, in the, about grief and about hearing some of those things and these topics and having them hit, uh, hit you emotionally as well. I suppose, yeah. Andy, you've been working on this for 30 years. You've seen the ins and outs of it. I guess I've got a two part question for you. This is for me. Do you feel like there's a rising tide of people raising their voices and engaging with this? And also, do you see a rise in uh, climate grief and um, and fear? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yes to both. And I, I was thinking about this the other day as I was looking at some of the you know latest reports on the science. And, and basically, I think something that I feared would happen and said I feared would happen about 15 years ago has happened. Um, and that is that if we did not get our act on and act, we would go from a situation where large parts of the population are in denial that is even happening almost overnight to despair that it's all too late. <laughs> so we, we did nothing and now we're terrified because we've done nothing. Um, uh, and, and that's a terrible situation to be in. And this is where I think the church has a really important role, uh, because I think now when you look out there, there is now you know, in contrast to 15 years ago, there is much, much more public awareness that this is happening. And there is almost immediately a sense of it's all too late. You know, it's it, 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 one level, it's, it, 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 you know, it's so, so sad and tragic. However, I think that the answer to that is action, is well-guided action together, which not only has the biggest chance of making a change, but it's in that acting together that people can also find reasons for hope, understanding, a different view of the world, and so on, that can give them a genuine hope and not just a good feeling. You see what I mean? Um, uh, you know, I, I, I've been doing this for a long time, but I, there's not a meeting that goes by that I didn't learn something I didn't know before. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. I wonder if we could employ, employ that in the next campaign or, or, or whatever, you know? So, so there's nothing like working together collaboratively to start to give you a bit more hope in these things for, for practical reasons. Do you think that's part of the silver lining or, uh, silver lining is hard to say, but in terms of climate emergency that it may push us towards 
reimagining community. I think that's part of what we're talking about. We're talking about reimagining communities of faith yeah. and that maybe the way that we do church and the way that we can sometimes even consume church or yeah. attend it, but then live a different way and yeah. uh, kind of an inherent duplicity. Yeah. Is it really going to cut the mustard in, in a current, in an age of climate emergency? Yeah, and I, and, and I think as I kind of, uh, I, I, I can't remember which point I cut out, but as I was trying to say at one point, I think there are so many benefits here for the wider mission of the church, which is absolutely not why the church should do it. It should do it because it's the right thing to do. But I've seen it with my own eyes. This is not just theory. You know, in, in, in just about every church I go to to preach, with, I'm told a story of how the church did this. And some local came along and saw it and said, oh, what's going on there? I mean, I've seen it with my own local church, my wife's church. Um, but it happens all the time. It, it's obvious that the church acting on this, where it is acting on this, is, is drawing other people to us. And it's also drawing us to them and building bridges in the community that perhaps weren't there before. And if we and, and climate change is going to need resilient communities. I mean, if I can just be a little bit controversial for a while, I remember back to that period after the Brexit vote, um, we went four years without actually leaving the EU because the country was so massively divided. And actually, absolutely nothing had happened. We, we, we'd done nothing. I'm not saying we should or we shouldn't. I'm saying one issue divided us so much. Man, if we think Brexit did that to the UK, what do you think climate change is going to do? We have absolutely got to build bridges in the community, build trust across um, ethnic groups, across uh, income brackets, across whatever, to be able to come up with, as the other questioner was asking, actually locally viable solutions, making resilient communities that are physically resilient, but also emotionally, that don't descend into conflict and chaos when the next flood comes, frankly. Um, and, and so I, I, I think there's a huge um the church has a huge role to play in building resilient communities as part of its normal mission and that will benefit and that will see the church itself have a new vision and motivation and and focus for real really serving the community in a time of climate crisis and and and, and nature breakdown basically mm -hmm. um i totally agree with you and i think i just from a hazelnut perspective one of the things that we're passionate about is um that it comes from grassroots and local communities and people. So, so much of I, what I've noticed is so much of kind of the change that we see is coming from a synod level from the Church of England or from a diocese. And it's kind of top down. So we're going to have experts meet in a room and that's all really good. There's no question whether that's good or not. It is good. Mm -hmm. But also having from the other end, local communities living differently, making choices. I think there's a powerful place yeah. for us to meet in the middle there yeah. um and i think we need to see more kind of coming up from the bottom as well and be encouraged to I, I i know i totally agree with that and i and i think um one of the things you know we, we need a fast transition to a green economy but it's got to be fair it's no point in being fast and making injustices even worse yeah in a way that covid has made injustices even worse We've yeah. got to do this fairly. And, and therefore, I think the church needs to play a role, or I'd like to see the church play a role. Somebody's got to play a role in local communities, in holding the holding the ring, if you like, for the poor, the vulnerable, the voices that aren't normally heard to go, this is what's coming down the tracks. How's this going to affect you? Let them speak. Let us hear what it's going to mean to them and, and work with them to head that off because otherwise it'll be the same old thing. It'll be the, the, those with loud voices, the gobby ones, the ones with money that mm. do what they want to do, whether or not actually it's fair to everybody else. Like go to space, for instance. Well, I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, you know, I better not say what I think of that. You know? Yeah, fair enough. Um, we've got a really good um, question from Katie Brooker. Uh, the question is, also she's a member of Hazelnut, so this is going to be good. Um, <laughs> We're big fans of Katie. Uh, thinking about the indigenous connection to land that you referred to, can you speak to the need for the church to rebuild a spiritual direct connection to the land? So rather than seeing it as something outside of ourselves and our communities to celebrate and protect, it is integral to our collective and inner lives. Yeah, um, so I, I, I'll be candid, this is not an area I feel any kind of expert in. So I'm coming at this more as a as a normal human being who's been a Christian quite a while and is looking at the fact that I may die sometime in the next 20 years, probably, you know. 
Um, I was always struck by Ashes to Ashes, Dust to Dust. Um, uh, it's in a David Bowie song, but I think it originally came from the Bible, actually. <laughs> um, and I recently visited uh, actually the tree where my father-in-law's ashes are scattered. And I thought, what a beautiful thing. There somewhere, there is Jeff or the remains of him. He was a very good father-in-law to me. And he's now some part of a big old oak tree, <laughs> somehow. And that made me really happy. And I thought, yeah, you know, we are all gonna die. We need to recognize we are carbon. We come from the soil. We go back to the soil in one form or another. And, and I wonder if part of the, this is not just a, an emotional story, I hope. Um, part of where I'm getting at here is I think it begins perhaps with us understanding literally scientifically what we are. We are carbon, we are carbon and water. We are like the soil. We could become soil. <laughs> um, and I, I just wonder, it's, it's a notion. It's not a, you know, this is not a, a theological treatise. It's just a notion that one way to get us back to understanding the importance of, of, of soil is to understand what we ourselves are. We are the stuff of soil. Adam, apparently, was made from the soil. That's what we are, guys. Sometimes in beautiful formation, you know, sometimes in stunted formation, sometimes in all sorts of formation, but actually soil. I, and I wonder, um, uh, um, I mean, part of this has been part of my journey as well, is kind of thinking about a larger picture. So I want to, and I'd be interested to hear what you think about this. I wonder if and um, and um, one of our um, uh, other speakers is going to speak about this. He wrote a book, uh, "Making Peace with the Land." Norman is going to be speaking um, uh, tomorrow. He's going to be our final speaker, and he says we've kind of lost the image of Earth in our kind of in our theology, in our liturgy. And we kind of edited that out, and I'm wondering if we've almost kind of um, created a church that is um, so wholesale Gnostic that we literally just see ourselves only as spiritual beings, and so. Even, for yeah. instance, what you're referring to, death is only a spiritual experience and there's no physicality to it. Yeah. Um, what do you think about that? Do you think there's a possibility that we have lost the image of Earth? Therefore, we've almost lost a whole piece of what we're created to encounter as Christians and as yeah. human beings. Yeah, I do. I mean, I, you know, I may, I'm, I may be, I, may, I hope I'm understanding you correctly. I certainly think that we, uh, I think somebody else was saying in the questions there, you know, there's a danger we see ourselves as something completely separate. Um, there's the earth out there, there's the land, there's the, the dirt I walk on, the street, the whatever, and there's all these things going on, and then there's little old me. We, we, we have lost the understanding, I think, both scientifically and, and as well, you know, just practically, factually, as how we are connected. Not just earth, but, you know, um, how much we need nature generally. You know, we, we here, I mean, I do this experiment, some talks I give, somebody here may even have been a victim of it, is I just ask people to... Um, uh, hold their breath as long as they don't have any medical conditions. Hold their breath and put the hand up um, in, in like a lecture room. And when and when you can't breathe anymore, put your hand down. Now, generally speaking, after about forty seconds, all the hands have come down. I said, right, that's how long any one of us here can last without nature. That was air you were being deprived of. It's made by the soil and the trees and the whatever. You know. So I think I think there is a need to establish how physically dependent we are. And we, we can't even last two minutes without the products of nature, mm. you know? And, and, and that's where I would go, just like, just to like, just a matter of fact, do you realize how dependent you are on this stuff? You know? mm. I think, um, I just kind of a personal story to throw in here as well. When we had that first lockdown, um, at least personally, it uh, really threw me into a whole tailspin because it kind of deconstructed the safety and the yeah. protection. All of a sudden you're confronted with your, mortality at least i was yeah and, uh and uh, like other people you know throwing yourself into gardening and things and it was really interesting getting into composting and thinking um that you know there is eternity but there's also part of my story is is being human and going yeah. back to the earth and not in a way that um yeah and i just found that i found that actually really encouraging yeah. that that even even in death if that was what would happen I'm glad it didn't, but I still add something yeah. back. And that was really powerful for me to kind yeah. of. Uh, I, I'm sure that. there are, I'm a, I, I know there are other speakers you've got who will speak to this in much more 
depth, I think, but I think there's a lot of research now out there about um, just how uh, mentally and emotionally um, stabilizing uh, and healthy it is to be in regular contact, not just with nature, but with the soil itself. Mm. And, and, I, and I can't help but think that, you know, that there's something going on. It's probably God's little joke. He's probably thinking, so it took you so long to figure this out. What do you think I made you for? What do you think? <laughs> how do you think you were formed you know you, uh, um be, because the, the evidence now is huge about, about the, the 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 need of all of us and the benefits of all of us of just being in nature in some form for some that will be regular gardening for others it'll be going bird watching or just listening to you know ducks in a, in a pond it doesn't matter you know it, it, it's a connection with something other than us that is also alive that is that is alive but material like us and will die like us and will go back to actually pretty much the same thing and and i think that you know that so but people seem to be getting something from that knowledge now rather than thinking that's outrageous we're some sort of animal we thought we were above that um we seem to have turned a bit of a corner i think partly that's COVID again people realizing just how much at some level even if they don't talk about it even if they don't explain it to themselves or even if they don't understand what's going on the recognition that we all benefit from regular access to nature. In fact, I mentioned earlier our, our, our th three big aims for Russia. I only mentioned one. The second one is actually churches for nature, and the third one is nature for people. We we want to see the people of this country getting f equal access to good nature as a gift from God that it should be. Whereas at the moment, if you live on the thirteenth floor of a tower block in Hackney and you're being regularly beaten up by your abusive partner, your access to nature is very, very different from somebody who lives in the new forest with a four by four. So, so uh, you know, as, as an act of service to God's creation, people, we believe we should be campaigning for everybody to have decent access to good nature. And it, we, um, it's great to hear your thoughts and we've got loads of great chat happening as well we've got like this really rich second conference happening in the chat it's really really good um we um i just want to ask one question i think we've had some really good chat here um someone asked early on and i'm sorry i can't remember who it was but they asked how we could pray for you and the work of arasha so if you could um give us a couple pointers and then it would be great for us to actually pray for you and and the work of arasha and even maybe even if you have some larger points we can pray that i'll close oh, that's really really kind I think um, big picture, we are, I, I mentioned, uh, I just mentioned again, our, our, our big new aims. Um, we are working through at the moment what that would practically look like over the next five years. And I mentioned the land goal, we're talking about 75,000 acres of land, but we've actually got another four goals um, that would deliver those three 10 year aims, if you like. So we're working through those and there's a lot of discussion, rich debate, prayer going on, for example, on Eco Church, you know, how many churches do we think we could actually get going on this? And, and what would get going actually look like? What quality would that be? And so on. So I really value prayers for myself, the team, the staff team, we're only a small staff team, um, and, and, and the trustees as we work through those things. Um, and what we're after is not what is scientifically provable or what we actually think we can do with the money we've got at the moment. What we're after is what does God want us to do? And, and, and we believe that the resources will come if we can be clear about that so just pray for that discernment I'd, I'd be really grateful for that the other thing is um uh actually quite um recent and uh, I, w I won't say too much but the um one of the key staff members of of climate sunday um uh, I, I chair the coalition but there's 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 a, a small staff um had a very serious car accident um just a week or two ago um it's a miracle he's alive um, and we're grateful he is, um, but he, is, he and he, his family are in, in recovery um, just at the point when we were really uh, needing to go into full action mode on, on Climate Sunday. Now, I think it's pretty much under control. Um, there are various other people who can step into the breach, but I'd be really grateful for prayers for, for quick healing in, in its own right uh, for my colleague James um and, and also for those that were stepping into the breach to keep the climate sunday initiative going i mean it, it's so important at this moment and uh we're glad he's alive but um uh it, it was a very close shave so mm. thank you thanks well why don't i why don't i close this time in prayer for those things um it's a good a good spot where we're at 
Um, again, you can continue these conversations over in our um, social area as well. Um, and then I'll um, pray and we'll stop the recording and then I'll just say a couple of quick announcements as we head to the next section as well. So Lord, we just lift up all that Andy has mentioned, bring first before you, James. We ask for your peace with him and his family. We ask for wisdom for those around him and supporting him and with, as well as wisdom for Climate Sunday. Um, Lord, that you would just be present. You are present, that you would continue to um, encourage and bring your peace and your healing. Lord, we also um, thank you for Russia and the work that they're doing and just for the length of time they've um, with others been stepping out and advocating for creation. And Lord, we just ask that we'd have more and more voices and resources being added to that. Um, more creativity, more unique initiatives. Lord, there'd be lots of voices coming from lots of angles, Lord. And you ask that you'd bring, um, continue to raise the church's voice in all of this as well. Bless the rest of our day in your name. Amen.